All right, start it. Great. Okay. So, uh, firstly, just thank you everybody for um, for joining us again after this uh, slight delay with uh, with the course content and so on. Uh, but today we've got a really special um, course at the, that's going to take place. Uh, so, for for anyone who hasn't met Ashwin. Um, uh, it's probably a good idea to introduce yourself in a moment, Ashwin, but uh, I just wanted to take a moment to thank him for taking the time to do this. Um, it is in collaboration with the with the company you work for, is that correct? Yep, Eugen. Yeah, uh, but ultimately, you know, this is it's still, it's a free offering, um, and I, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting course. Uh, from what Ashwin has shown me so far, it sounds um, it sounds like the kind of course that I would have loved to um, to be able to take when I started learning how to code. So I think there's loads for you to learn. Um, without further ado, I'll just stop talking and pass over to Ashwin. Okay, thank you for that introduction, uh, Sunil. Um, yeah, I'm Ashwin, and uh, I'm a software engineer. I have about five years of experience in full stack web development. And uh, I work as a developer advocate at my current organization. Um, so I do a lot of writing. Um, and over the last few months, I've been doing lots and lots of technical blogging. And um, uh, I felt it was about time that I started to sort of teach people as well with live coding sessions on how to build some of the most, uh, some of the more recently popular applications out there. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and you know, they, as they say, the best way to learn is by doing things, right? It's by teaching it to others. So just like you, I was also learning a lot of these things myself just over the last one month or so. And, uh, and I, I believe I have some understanding of how, uh, you know, how to go about building it. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna teach it to you right now. <laughs> okay, so, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let me know if any of you are not able to see it. Cool. So yeah, uh, this is our first session on how to build a Clubhouse clone. And yeah, brought to you by Stack Academic from Sunil and uh, Egen, uh, that is the organization where I work with. and. What we're going to do is build this application called Clubhouse, uh, which has been super popular um, in the year 2020. That was the first time when it was launched on iPhone. And since then, it's just boomed, right? Um, and, uh, we, and recently, they just sort of launched it on Android as well, uh, which is why I got, my, I got to use the app as well. And, uh, I, I really like it. There's, it's a really it's a really interesting application uh, where you you can sort of join a room within the app and you can have conversations using audio. Uh, so it's just like uh, a Zoom conversation, uh, but with also the social features of a social networking app, um, right? Uh, and uh, you can once you're in the app, you can follow. Um, people, you can follow clubs, and you can hop in into any conversation that you find interesting, and you can participate uh, in those conversations as well. And all of this is just using audio, nothing else, right? And uh, it may be curious what, what technologies are used to build this app, um, and um, what are the challenges, and it made me think, why not try to build something like it myself? Um, yeah, it took me a while, uh, but I believe I now can show you how you can build something similar for yourself as well. Okay, um, so here's what you're going to learn uh, over the course of uh, several sessions. Um, you're going to be learning relational database design. Um, you'll also learn um, RESTful web services. Um, which are typically referred to as APIs. And APIs are an important part in any internet-based application, right? And you're gonna learn about WebSockets as well. And finally, 
you learn about WebRTC, which stands for real, Web Real-Time Communication. And uh, that's the feature that's built into most modern web browsers that enables um, real-time communication, uh, such as the apps like you're using right now, which is Zoom. Uh, I think uh, if you participated in our previous sessions, you were using Jitsi. So all of them rely on this core web technology called WebRTC um, to sort of uh, enable real-time communication. Um, and over to the right, you can see here are some of the technologies that you'll use while building this. Um, HTML5 and JavaScript, um, and that's because uh, it's pretty much the de facto technologies um, for, for uh, a browser, right? Any browser-based application would involve uh, you using HTML and JavaScript. Um, and WebRTC, as I said earlier, and you, you're gonna learn how to use Node.js uh, for building a web server, right? And for also talking to your database and pulling out information and present, presenting it to you in the form of APIs. And for the database itself, you use um, this relational database called Postgres, uh, which is very similar to MySQL. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess, uh, the prerequisites that you probably might need in order to um, learn this course effectively is, um, it will be useful if you already know HTML and JavaScript. Um, you don't have to be an expert or a master in it, but some knowledge about these technologies would be useful uh, in the learning process. And uh, it's also gonna be useful if you, um, if you understand uh, the concepts such as a web server, why do you need a web server and how does it help? And uh, what do you mean by uh, RESTful web services? That's uh, some knowledge about that is also gonna be um, useful for you. And I guess that's it. It's gonna be very beginner friendly. And even if you don't know any one of these technologies, don't fret about it. Um, we are just, we're gonna go through it in more detail and um, if you have any questions uh, about some topic uh, as I go about teaching you, uh, please feel free to uh, ping me on uh, you know, social media. I'll, I'll be sharing you the details of that um, towards the end. Um, and I'll, I'll try to answer your questions too. Okay, so what I wanna do in today's session is first, I wanna just sort of show you how, what is Clubhouse? I guess some of you might already be aware of what it is, um, but if you're not, I, I just wanna, I'm gonna take you through a quick walkthrough of the application and what does it do? And why are people so fascinated by it? And secondly, what do you need in order to build this app? Some of it, which we already covered in the, pre, uh, in the previous slide. And then I'm gonna dive into sort of why we are trying to build this application in the first place. What, what's the advantage behind project-based learning? Like what makes it so effective? And finally, we're just gonna dive into some of the, um, the, the sort of categories of data within the app and then try to model a very, a very minimal database out of it uh, where we can store and retrieve information from. So here's the, I'm just gonna take you through a quick tour of the application. Um, and um, I, what you're seeing right now in the screen is a screenshot that I grabbed from the Google Play Store. Um, you, you might find a similar screenshot from the App Store as well if you have an iPhone. Um, and this is one of the main features of Clubhouse. Uh, what you're seeing right now in the screen on the right over here, is a list of rooms um, and uh, you can, it's, it's a basically a list where you can scroll through and you are going to find rooms based on your interests and the clubs that you follow, right? Um, and what you can do after that is you can click on a room um, and it's gonna take you to this screen uh, it's going to be coming up as a pop-up. Um, and what you, what you have in this screen is basically uh, on the first, 
on the top first, you have a list of speakers, uh, people who are talking with each other, and you will be able to listen to what they're, they're speaking, right? And um, you can also see uh, yourself, but you'll be uh, as part of the audience, right? You're not gonna be a speaker by default, but you will just be a listener the first time you join a room, okay? And if you at any point want to participate in the conversations, you can click on this little hand icon over here uh, that, you can, that you see on the, on the bottom right corner. Uh, that's basically when you click on, when you tap on that icon, it, it sends a request to one of the moderators in the room and they can grant you permission uh, and invite you on the stage so that you can now start speaking with other people and you can participate in the conversations, correct? And finally, when you're done speaking, you can click on the small button on the bottom left, the peace out sim the sign uh, that says leave quietly. And if you click on that icon, it's gonna take you back to this screen. And that's pretty much it for the actual Clubhouse app. So what you are going to build is gonna look like this. Um, and I'm just gonna show it to you in a moment. Yeah, here you go. So this is the final app that you are going to build um, as you progress, um, as you make progress uh, throughout the course. Uh, and I've, I have it deployed on Heroku. So let's compare both screens. So on the top, you see a list of rooms and each of these are, uh, is basically representing one room, right? A single room. And this, the, on, the, on the very top, you see the club name um, that the room belongs to. And right below that, you see the name of the room and followed by the participant names. And then you're gonna see the total number of participants, right? Over here, it says zero in, our, in the application. Uh, on the screenshot, you can see that there's 1.3K participants in the room, right? And this number uh, right next to it shows the number of speakers on the speaker list. So that's, that's essentially it. So yeah, you can just scroll through this list and let me just open up. Um, you can log in as a user. So I've created some dummy users. So I'm, if I log in as Ashwin, that's me. I'm gonna see a greeting that says, howdy Ashwin. Right? And we're gonna build this feature as well. And what happens when I click on one room is it's gonna, it's gonna open up this small box to the, to the right-hand side because we are building a web application. I just try to keep it simple. And um, this essentially represents the, the screen within a single room. Um, yeah, where you can see the room name and the club name, the number of participants. And once you click on leave quietly, it's gonna quit the room and take you out of the room, back to this, the earlier screen. Okay, we have a new participant, cool. So that's about it for the app tour. And obviously we're not gonna cover all the features. There's tons of features within the actual application but for keeping things simple, what we're really interested in is the real-time communication, right? Um, um, that's what we're interested to build and replicate. Um, so that's what we're gonna uh, be focusing on in the series of lectures. Now, I just wanna sort of give you a quick dive of our learning goals. And uh, these goals might apply um, to anybody, uh, wherever you are in your learning journey, you might be a beginner or you might be an experienced uh, professional in the industry, um, but it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, what I'm trying to say here is uh, some, one of the most effective ways of uh, building this, uh, building projects uh, is that you get to see a real life example Right, learning by examples is perhaps the most um, 
most effective ways to learn. And, uh, you know, it reminds me of this essay that I read earlier. It's called A Mathematician's Lament. It's, a, it's basically a story where there are these small children who are not allowed to listen or play music until they've mastered over a decade, um, you know, mastering music notation and theory and spending classes, understanding the sheet music. And only after a decade, they're finally allowed to play and listen to music. And uh, if you notice a lot of times, this is how it's taught in universities. Uh, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on learning fundamentals that we claim will pay off later because uh, that's gonna be useful. But the problem is most of uh, people who start learning in this way, sort of leave halfway through, right? Um, so I believe that a top-down approach, you know, learning by doing, you see an app, uh, a, a project, and you're really interested in and curious to know how it works, you know, start by just trying to build one. And in that process, you get to learn a bunch of details, right? And that's very effective because it's gonna make you more curious um, and it's gonna, you're gonna have a hundred different questions um, once, you, once you begin with that approach and you will by then be equipped with all the intellectual tools that enable you to dive in deeper further when you need to, right? So I wanna teach you the whole game of app development, all the moving pieces, what, what constitutes a backend and front end, full stack, how these pieces fit in together, right? And secondly, I wanna teach you uh, technologies that are useful and practical, and that's gonna help you find a job, right? And several of these technologies are really, really de in demand in, uh, in the programming uh, world, in the tech, tech industry. Uh, so, I'm just going to share you um, the Stack Overflow uh, 2020, 2020 Stack Overflow Developer Survey results. And when you see here, uh, and you click on technology, and when you go to most popular technologies, yep, right at the top, you see JavaScript, um, which is uh, not surprising because it's very much in demand. Uh, you need it for any kind of web application, right? Standing at 67% and then followed closely by HTML and CSS, right? Um, because these are essential tools for building a user interface uh, that works in a browser. And if you also go to most loved technologies, you're gonna find Python and JavaScript and few other languages as well. And um, why Node.js in specifically? The reason why I chose Node.js is because you can just use one language to build an entire application. If you already know JavaScript, uh, you can use JavaScript in the backend along with Node.js, and that's gonna help you code even the, uh, a web server, an entire web server, and it's gonna help you building a front end, right? Uh, and that is one of the reasons why Node.js enable a lot of front end developers to become full stack developers. Uh, because they just had to learn this one single language uh, and they could just, that would enable them to build this whole application, right? And Node.js is also extremely uh, in demand. Um, you know, a lot of startups use it, a lot of big companies uh, use Node.js as well. And let's look at Postgres. If you look at the databases, uh, what's the most popular databases? Uh, right at the top, you see MySQL, um, and followed by Postgres. And that makes sense because MySQL has been, uh, it's been there for much longer than Postgres. And that's one of the reasons why it's very, very popular. Um, but it's also useful because it's, it's, it helps you build a relational database system. And Postgres is one of the few databases that really shines in this regard, right? Uh, and this is not to say that NoSQL isn't good. Um, in fact, it's very good. And when I first started out um, from front end and moving to back end, my first database choice was MongoDB uh, because MongoDB was really simple, right? Uh, it enabled me to just um, build my application super fast, right? I don't need to think too much about the database architecture. 
um, everything is just uh, stored in the form of JSON based documents, right? But, and I was actually going to build this Clubhouse application using MongoDB, but then I thought that it's really important to learn relational database design, uh, especially if you have, if you want to forge a career somewhere along the lines of machine learning or data science, right? Uh, you want you want to use a, a uh, you want to use a database that allows you to type in meaningful queries and extract out very contextual, very meaningful information out of it. And that's precisely what relational databases provide you, right? Um, so we're going to learn Postgres, and and we're going to use JavaScript and Node.js as well. So that's a little bit about the technologies. And hopefully all of this is gonna help you build a portfolio of projects, right? When you, and that's gonna be useful when you try to find a job out there. And finally, we wanna have fun. Um, and I think building an application like this that's immensely popular is gonna be super fun. So there you go. Okay, so what are we going to do now is we are first going to look at the app and sort of just try to dissect the user interface and try to examine what categories of data do we have in the application, okay? Um, how, how, what, what, what are the actors, what are the players? And you, uh, some of these uh, words that I use, um, for example, this word called entity might sound a little too um, technical for you, but don't worry about it. It's actually a, a, a useful term as you, as I'm gonna show you uh, in a bit, but we're just gonna sort of see the app and see and, and sort of try to determine what uh, categories of data are present in the app. So let's take a look at the previous screen. So this is the home screen of the app. Um, Clubhouse calls this hallway where you're seeing a list of rooms and some data within those rooms. What are, let's try to understand what those data might be. So over here, right next to the green icon, this is the name of the club. And which is to say that we have something called clubs present in the application, right? And these cards that you have, those are what you call rooms. And you can start a room within a club, or you can start a room that's not in any club. And if, in that case, it's not gonna have any club name. So if you notice the second, the, the card over here in the screenshot, this doesn't have the, the name of the club. That's because it's not within any, any club, right? It's just a room uh, that, that's gonna display when, when anybody goes to the screen, okay? What else do we have? We have users. That's the third kind of, that's another category of data, right? You have users who can join a room and become participants, okay? So at the very, on a very high level, these three could be called entities. This is what I refer to as entity, um, you know, actors who, who or the data categories within an application. And it's always useful to look at the user interface before designing your database, right? Because the user interface and the functionality, the user experience is gonna give you a lot of clue as to how to architecture your database and what, what even to use. Do you wanna use a NoSQL database or a relational database? You'll get a lot of information about that by understanding who your users are and what's the user interface going to look like, right? So that way you can choose a, a, an architecture that's very efficient and that's optimized in order to retrieve this information and to store this information, okay? So I'm gonna just sort of open this screen. Uh, this is something called diagrams.net. Um, so, what, you, what you're seeing right now in this screen is basically 
um, imagine this as some sort of canvas where you can draw um, you know, diagrams, right? You can draw flow charts, you can draw, you know, UML, uh, you can draw, um, you know, you, you can sort of use this, um, use this app to sort of draw these small diagrams that are called entity relationship diagrams. And that's gonna help you visualize uh, the various uh, categories of data in your application. And it's very useful to make this diagram because it's gonna give you a, a higher picture and you can show this to somebody in your team if you are working in production in a company, uh, you always start with sort of identifying the data categories and making diagrams. And then you, what you can do is you can sort of plot relationships between each other. How are these categories, these different categories of data are related to each other, right? So what we have here, is as we, as we identified, we have users, right? And for this category of data, you can have some fields related, some properties or some attributes related to this, um, this user, right? And what, what those could be, uh, it could be a username, a user could have a username, uh, they could have a name and you might also want to keep information about uh, at what date they joined the app and a bio and an email, right? Uh, that's pretty much standard stuff for most applications out there, uh, especially social networking applications. Then you have clubs, right? Um, so clubs are basically, that's what forms the core of Clubhouse, right? You have a name for the club and you have a date, which is basically to show people when the club was created. And then clubs can have, can be associated with topics, right? That way uh, you can sort of decide in the actual app, actually, when you see, uh, you can actually choose your interest and the room list that you saw in the earlier screenshot that's going to be curated for you based on the interests of your of your uh, based on your own the topics that you subscribe to and the interests that you like um, the the main screen where you see the list of rooms they're going to be sort of customized for you based on those interests so each club could belong to a certain category let's say uh, if i start a software engineering club i could I could perhaps give it a topic or a category called technology, right? And let's say if I start a similar other club, um, let's say veganism, that could come in a category called fitness, right? So you can imagine many such different categories for different clubs. And we have rooms. Now rooms, as I showed you earlier, these are rooms and uh, uh, rooms can be associated with a club and that's why we have a club id on the on the bottom and we also have the room name and we have the date of the room okay now hopefully that all makes sense and what you're seeing over here um i think you can see the type of data over here uh varkar stands for something that's essentially a string but with the character limit Okay, and date is of uh, a certain type, uh, in which case, this, in this case, it's timestamp. And you also have IDs. So every, um, every data point for that category is gonna be associated with an ID, right? And that way it's gonna be useful for us to change or modify or pick out that data point from all the rest. So, what can we do now is, now these are the main entities of your app, but you want to also sort of visualize how are these um, entities are related with each other, okay? And that's going to help you decide what tables to, to create in your database. So, so here's the next diagram where I have sort of mapped out and this diagram shows you the 
the relationships between all these different entities, right? So each club can have many rooms. So I'm just trying to, I'm just going to try to zoom in a little bit. Uh, let me know if you're not able to see it properly. Yeah, so if you notice over here, each club can be associated with many rooms. And that's why we have these three, um, these three, um, I guess I can call it endpoints of this line uh, that shows a one to many relationship. One club can have many rooms. So that's a one to many relationship. Okay. And what we have over here is a one to many relationship between clubs, right? Uh, uh, users and clubs. So each user can be a founder, again, can start many clubs, right? So that's again, a one to many relationship between those two entities. Um, and if the idea, if the name entity sounds a bit confusing, you can imagine entities as tables within a database, right? We have, we create different tables within a database to represent different kinds of information, right? Uh, but in before you go about creating a database, uh, what the standard notation that we uh, people usually refer to is entity. That's why this diagram is called an entity relationship diagram. Okay. And similarly, there are other kinds of relationships as well. For example, if you're a user, you can actually follow clubs, right? So there is a a, a one-to-many relationship between a user and the club by being a follower of many clubs. If that, hopefully that makes sense to you. So, but on the other hand, one club can also have many followers, right? A, one club can be followed by many users. So in this case, it's actually one-to-many from both sides that makes it a many to many relationship okay so in the in the database world if you are especially working with a relational database system how, the way you represent this is by using a third table now that third table is used as a conjunction table to map out this relationship so i have a table here which says followers and i'm going to show you what this means in some detail um, so over here, I have something called PK, if you notice on the users table, um, and PK stands for a primary key, okay? And a primary key is essentially used as an index by whatever database you use uh, in order for the database to quickly retrieve the information. So you can provide this primary key and you can, you can get back that specific entry from that table. Um, and a primary key also is useful when you need to join two or more tables together. Um, so in the relational databases, it's very common to, to create links between tables um, because the, you are trying to create a relational database system, right? Everything is related with each other in some way. Um, and that's why we have these uh, notations. What this notation stands for uh, is called crow's feet. It's called crow's feet notation. Um, and that crow's feet notation essentially tells you what relationship exists between two tables. So there exists a one to many relationship between users and clubs because a user can create many clubs. They can be a creator, they can be a founder at many clubs. There also exists a many to many relationship between users and clubs because a user can follow many clubs and likewise, a club can have many followers. Hopefully that makes sense to you. So that many to many relationship is commonly represented by this third table followers, right? So you can notice here that 
In the followers table, we have a club ID and the club ID is as a link to the club table. And we also have a user ID and the user ID is linked to the users table. And you can see that there is a one to many relationship between follower and user. There also is a one to many relationship between clubs and followers. So overall, a user and a club have a many to many relationship. Now, similarly, there is also a relationship between a user and a room within a club, right? Uh, because when you join a room, you're essentially a participant in that room, right? And that is also essentially a many to many relationship. Why? Because a user can be a participant at many rooms. And likewise, a room can have many participants. So that makes it many to many relationship. So again, we have this table called participants over here. And this participant allow is you this table allows you to sort of map out this many to many relationship, right? So we have a room ID over here that links to the room table. And then we also have a user ID that links to the users table, right? Um, that's pretty much for the entity relationship diagram, okay? And what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna try to, um, we're gonna try to create tables for all these uh, different relationships. And we're gonna add some dummy data as well. So if you've been following the link that was in the Discord channel, I have uh, some, I have a repository that has some, some boilerplate code for you, uh, which I'm going to go to right now. Yeah, so if you haven't um, if you haven't cloned this repository already, um, I urge you to just go to this link over here and clone this repository and just follow the instructions to install the database, install Node.js and uh, the rest of the project dependencies because we're gonna be using that uh, in, in our lecture. So, I have my terminal open over here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna type in this command. Um, if you, let me just, I'll just try to make the font a little bigger for you. I'm not sure why that didn't work. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry, here we go. So this is my Postgres um, command line interface uh, and you can install this. Uh, if you have installed Postgres in your system, you'll get this, um, this command line interface called PSQL where you can go into this terminal and you can type in SQL commands, right? Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a database 
and then we are just going to create tables for each one of the each one of the the data categories that we just saw right now okay so so first thing is if you ever want to create a new database you can type this command call create database um, clubhouse that's the first command and you have to use a semicolon and that's gonna tell you that it created a database right next what you can do is you can switch to this database so that any subsequent commands that you apply will get applied to this database and not to something else and so i'm gonna be typing in this command slash c clubhouse semicolon and enter so now i'm inside this clubhouse database and any other commands that i type some from here on it's gonna apply to this database itself okay so i'm just gonna open my editor for a second here so yeah this is vs code and and i'll i'll explain the folder structure maybe in the next session but for now you can go to models if you clone this repository there's this folder called models and you can open this file called schema schema.txt and that has all the commands for you in order to create the tables for the various data categories that we identified so I'm going to create a table for topics or interests. So the command is really easy. Um, you just have to call. If you want to ever create a table, what you can do is mention create, followed by table, and followed by the table name. And it can be any name you want. And then what you do is, you sort of describe the various columns in your tables, right? So I have an ID column, and then I have a name column, and then I have a description. So, and, and each column has a certain type associated with it. So my ID is of type bigint. And when I give this command generated by default, um, what's that gonna do is when I, save data inside this table it's going to automatically generate this id for me so i don't have to give it an id it can it, it just auto generates it by default and then i also say it's a primary key for my table um, and similarly the name field is uh, of type string i think if you have if you've seen the previous javascript videos in our sessions earlier um, you might know of the string data type um, and varkar is similar, very similar to a string, except that you have to give it the number of characters, right? It can't exceed this character. So you, that, that is defined by varkar and uh, open braces followed by the number of characters. And you also say that it's not null. Uh, what that means is if you try to, if you don't give it a name, uh, it's gonna throw an error right and followed by description uh, which is also a string data type of 500 character limit so that's what we did and over here it says that it's created the table so now if you want to see all the tables within your database you can just use this command um, slash forward slash bp this it stands for describe tables So you can see over here that it's it's listed out this name uh, of a, of a table, uh, saying that we've we, because we just created the table now, it's showing us the name of the table, topics, right? Um, similarly, 
we are going to create the users table. And I will just show you what each of these columns mean. So yeah, similarly, users table, it also has an ID field um, generated by default, uh, which we call it identity. Um, so we don't have to give it, uh, we don't have to provide an ID of our own, but we can if you want to, and it's gonna be our primary key. And we have your username, that's also uh, a string. It's not null and it has to be unique. So you can apply certain constraints when you're creating, uh, when, you're adding, when you're creating columns for your tables, you can add certain constraints. So this unique constraint makes sure that at any point in time, this particular field username is always gonna be unique. So because no two users should ever have the same username, right? And that's how we can, we can enforce this uniqueness by saying that it has to be unique. And similarly, emails, no two users have the same email. So we're gonna call it unique as well. Um, then we have the name of the user and then the bio and then the join date. So join date is of a type called timestamp. And we're seeing it, we're telling it that it should have a default value in case you don't provide the join date. And the default value would be the current timestamp, right? And next we will create the clubs table. So the clubs table is also very similar, but there's, one key difference, the clubs table has a foreign key. Um, and actually two foreign keys, I guess. Yeah. So you have a foreign key uh, for founder that points to the users table. So what that means is when you try to create a new club and you make a new entry in the database, in the table, the clubs table, you also need to provide a valid user ID. And that user needs to be present in the users table, right? And we have the name of the club, and then we have the topic ID, and then we have the date. And what we're saying here is the topic ID is a foreign key that refers to the topics table um, because each club can be associated with some topic like technology or healthcare or whatever, right? Depending on what club you wanna create, you can refer it to a certain topic. And we have all the topics listed. We're gonna save all the topics in the application in this table. And next, moving on to the rooms table, it follows a very similar structure that I showed earlier. Um, it's referring to the, it has a club ID that refers to the club table because each room can be associated to a club. And likewise, it also has a date field. Moving on, we have followers. Okay. Um, and followers is this conjunction table that we spoke about earlier. So a user uh, can be a follower at many clubs and likewise, a club can have many followers. And that's why we have a club ID that refers to the clubs table. And we also have a user ID that refers to the users table. And we're saying that the club ID and the user ID needs to be unique always. Um, and then finally, a last table, we have participants. All right, participants is also this representation of a many-to-many -many relationship between a user and a room, right? A user can belong, can be a participant at many rooms. And likewise, a room can have many participants, right? That's why we have a room ID that's, that points to the rooms table and we have a user ID that points to the users table. And we have a special field here that stays role. So if you look at the, 
application screenshot, when you join a room, you are by default part of the audience. Um, so that's one role that a participant can be uh, when they join a room. Um, and when you get invited as a speaker, you, your role becomes that of a speaker. So that's why we have a speaker role and an audience role. Now, if you notice over here, we also have these special green icons uh, that those special green icons mean that they are the moderators of the room, right? So moderators can invite other people on stage and they have super user privileges, right? They can ban people from the room. Um, they can end the room and they can put everyone on mute. Yeah, the, but there's a bunch of stuff that a moderator can do. So a participant can also be a moderator. And finally, we have hosts. Hosts are the people who create the room in the first place. And that's, that's like the super user of rooms, right? So we have four different roles for each of our participant. Any, a participant could be any one of these roles. And that's why we call, we say that the role is of the data type varchar, which is a string, but we also apply a check to see if the role is one of these strings, right? If you get, so that way, if you make a typo, if you give it a role that's not present over here, um, it's gonna throw an error and it's gonna complain that um, that role is not present. So it's not gonna create the entry in the database if you ever try to insert somebody in the, in the participants table. So that's about it for participants. And there's something called the peer ID. Um, and that is something that I'll be showing you when I get to the WebRTC part. Uh, the peer ID is gonna be useful for us um, to sort of enable real-time communication. And that's again, a unique identifier, um, but I'll dive into it in more detail in the next session. Right, so now we've created all of our tables. So you can look at all the tables over here by pressing the, by using this command forward slash DT, and that's gonna list all the tables here for you. And that way you can ensure that you've typed in the right set of commands, right? And there hasn't been any errors so far. Cool. Um, and then if you scroll below in our code, we also have some dummy data for you. Okay. So you can just copy paste them and insert these dummy values. So I'm inserting a, a five different topics, health, science, um, geopolitics, entertainment, technology. And then I also have some dummy users over here. So you can just copy paste and add them as well. Cool. Uh, if you feel free to join, if, to add your own username if you want, um, that would make it fun. We also have some dummy data for clubs. I'm gonna insert a few clubs over here. Um, we have a few club names, fit as a fiddle, council of ricks, world governments, video games, and a club on AI. Yeah, just some dummy values. And now we're gonna insert the rooms. Now, if you notice each club, each room is associated with some club over here. Uh, and I'll be showing you this shortly. Okay, and finally, we have followers. And we have participants. Great. So, now what we can do is, we just wanna make sure that all of our data values have been inserted properly, that there hasn't been any errors. So what I normally do is I just type in this command, um, select star from topics. And I have these bunch of topics over here. And similarly, I'm gonna see if all my users 
have been entered properly. So you can see that we have a bunch of data values, um, ID, username, email, and join date, um, and also the bio over here. Similarly, we can just type in for rooms. So we have these rooms over here. Achieving impossible tasks. And it's associated with the club ID one. And similarly, sometimes sciences are more art than science. That's the name of the, another room. It's also associated with a different club, right? So you can see over here, if I type select, when I, when I, what this command means essentially is, I'm, I'm saying to Postgres that I want to retrieve all the columns that exist in that table. But if I don't want all the columns, if I just want, let's say the name column, I can just type select name um, from rooms. So I'm just gonna see the names, right? I can also select the ID if I want. So if I press select ID name from rooms, I'm gonna see uh, ID and the name in the, in the return results. So now, check this out. So I'm gonna select those rooms that belong to the club ID one, okay? So as you can see, for this club, we have two rooms. And if you wanna know what this club is, you can just type select name from clubs where ID equals one. Yeah, so these two rooms belong to this club fit as a fiddle, right? And similarly, we can see the list of participants. Yep, all of them are there. And select star from followers. Yep. So looks like all of our data is successfully been imported to our database. Cool. So I guess it's been an hour now. So I'm just gonna end today's session and I'm gonna just sort of describe what we're gonna do in the next session. In the next session, what we wanna do is we wanna extract this information right over here in this screen, what we see is the club name, the names of the participants, the number of participants and the number of speakers. So in the next session, we're gonna dive into some more details on how to write uh, SQL queries and how to retrieve uh, the information uh, in order to sort of represent this home screen in Clubhouse, right? How to get all this information over there. And we're also gonna explore um, and write a query on how to retrieve uh, a, a, the, the details of a single room. So a single room contains the name of the room, the name of the club, and the number of speaker, the, the names of the speakers, excuse me, the name of the speakers and the name of the audience, uh, the, the participants in the audience. So we're gonna explore in more detail the next session how we can write effective queries in Postgres that lets you, that, that gives you this information right over here, okay? Um, I guess it's been an hour. So before ending the session, I would like to ask you all if you have any questions or if there's some part where you, know, you was a little bit confusing or maybe I went too fast, please let me know in the chat box and I'll try to answer them.
Okay, so I have a question from Aruntram. Uh, when you go to your app, it looks like in most clubs, the participants are none, but it shows that there is one speaker. Can you please explain? Sure, that's a good question. So I, that's because, um, let me just open the app for a second. Yeah, that's because uh, I there's there aren't any people in the audience yet. Uh, you see, uh, that's probably the reason why we don't have um, any participant in the room. Uh, the reason is because we nobody's using the room yet. Um, and there is another reason as well. For the purposes of this particular tutorial, what we'll be doing is as soon as you enter this link, if, whenever you click on a room, uh, just hold on a second, let me refresh this page. Yeah, so let's say I click on this room, Far Cry 6 reviews. So what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I'm sort of adding the participant as a speaker by default, right? Not as part of the audience, I'm adding them as part of a speaker. So their role becomes that of a speaker by default. And that's basically because I just wanna keep things simple um, while at the same time show you all the different roles that a participant could have. But in the interest of keeping things simple for this um, tutorial, I'm just gonna add everybody as a, as a speaker uh, whenever they enter a room. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that's the reason why you didn't see, uh, you, you didn't see uh, many, participants in the rest of the rooms over here. Um, but if you do find any bugs within this app, uh, feel free to try this out. I'm gonna share the link over here um, in the chat box. Yeah, you can log in as Rick, or you can log in as Elon. I'm, I'm just gonna share you with you a bunch of uh, usernames. Uh, actually, you can grab the usernames right from here in all the dummy data that we added, you can see that we have, um, sorry, uh, yeah, you can see that we have all these usernames over here. So you can just replace that uh, URL that I just shared. Uh, you can just replace my name with somebody else's name, one of these names over here and you can just log in and feel free to just try it out, you know, after the session is over, Maybe a bunch of you can just join a room and just see if that works. Uh, I think you'll need Chrome for it because I had some issues in the Firefox browser. Uh, but let me know if that if for some reason the app isn't working and I'll try to fix it. Cool. And do you have any other questions? Anybody? Uh, I'm just gonna be online for two more minutes. So feel free to ask me any questions that you have or if I've been going too fast or too slow. Uh, I'll try to answer it. Okay, so looks like we are done for today's session. And I hope, I hope you had fun and hopefully that was an insightful session for you all. And I promise you it's gonna get really, really interesting from, uh, from the next session onwards. Um, and I know that this session was a lot of theory, uh, but that's only because I wanted to set the context for you when you go about building this app. Uh, but in the next session, I promise it's gonna be a whole bunch of hands-on coding for you. Um, and if you have any other questions later on, I am available on Twitter, I am available on LinkedIn and on Discord on Stackademic. So feel free to ping me in any of these channels uh, with any questions that you have. And I will drop in the link for the next session very soon um, it's most likely going to be the following week, the same time, 
Um, but if you cannot, for some reason, attend any of these sessions, feel free to let me know. And this lesson particularly will also be uploaded on YouTube. So if some of you have been unable to follow some of these concepts and want to rewatch and relearn, um, you can do that right away. Um, I'll probably be uploading this video in a day or two. And that's it. Thank you for attending. You've been great so far. And I will see you in the next session.